Um, so I'm an emergency and addiction physician. I practice in the emergency department in San Diego. I go to work every day, and every single day I treat marijuana poisoning, every single day. Um, if you care about public health anywhere around the world, simply go to your emergency department, talk to your doctors, and that's where you could really see all the problems in your society, whether it's COVID, cannabis, or drugs, or whatever it is, probably around the world, um, you know, the, the canary in the coal mine of what's happening in society in the emergency, is in the emergency department. So this is where we see public health issues. And when I started my career as a doctor, I never saw marijuana poisonings in the emergency department. There was no such thing. And now I see one every single shift, multiple times a shift. And this is data from San Diego. Um, 37 cases a day in our emergency departments uh, across our county. Uh, huge mark. Uh, California was the first to legalize marijuana medicinally in 1996. This has been a long, long time. Um, in 2016, recreationally. And it went, um, the regulations in place have not been checked since 1996. And what we're living through now is what I would call a public health disaster. Why is that? And I'll share, this is kind of the answer right here in this slide, is, is the potency. The FDA approves Marinol, which is pure THC, with a maximum amount of 20 milligrams. Even at 15 milligrams, there's warnings about um, psychosis and a whole list. If you really want to know what's been published and agreed upon in the entire world, is just go to the FDA and read the package insert for Marinol. That's what THC is. And that was done with low potency data. In 1990, around when uh, marijuana was legalized in California, well, one grand joint was about 50 milligrams of THC. Now, in 2020, a one gram joint is 200 milligrams of THC, four times the amount. Edibles, a package of edibles is 100 milligrams per package. The effect of an edible is fivefold of that, the smoking, stays around longer. So it's equivalent to about 500 milligrams. And concentrates, have up to even 99% THC. So if we say 80%, let's say 80% THC of eight grams, it would be 6,400 milligrams of THC, equivalent of 128 1990 joints. And that's why I see marijuana poisonings every day. Um, medical is, the word medical related to cannabis is really a political definition, not a scientific definition. Doctors go to medical school for four years, residency another four years, board certification every 10 years, and I'm on my third episode of board exams. Um, if I gave amoxicillin, an antibiotic, without checking for drug interaction, the history, vital signs, something, I'd lose my license. That, that type of standard does not apply to the medical term for marijuana. And looking at the users in California, when California voted for compassionate use of marijuana, it was meant for people at end of life, with cancer. Um, less than 3% of Californians meet that definition. Um, the average age of the medical user is 32 years old. This is how I'll see it, but I'm just gonna share you some examples. So we just heard a great amount of, of data uh, from psychosis, suicides, vomiting, allergic reactions, bleeding, can you believe that? And I'll just show, share you some of those examples from the front lines. Pediatric exposure, this is the number one uh, poisoning across the United States in age under five years old. These are babies who are being hurt by cannabis. And in a study just recently published from our emergency department in uh, um, San Diego, the number one drug is the gummies. They get it mostly from their moms. Um, and the average age is two years old. Um, and this is a case four-year-old ate a gummy bear from her mom's purse. She became unconscious. Her eyes were vibrating in her head, nystagmus. She was admitted to ICU. There's no antidote. You can't take it out of your system. You could just control symptoms and wait to detoxify. Um, in a study of 52 hospitals across the United States, the mean age for marijuana poisoning was two years old. 13.3 infold increase in pediatric poisoning. 15% of the kids required to be in the ICU. Look at these candies. 
that are being sold and tell me they're not targeting children. Um, scrometing, that means screaming and vomiting. It's a word made by the emergency physicians to describe the audible diagnosis. We, I can hear the diagnosis sitting looking at my computer because nothing sounds like that. Screaming and vomiting is a diagnosis of cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. Dr. Finn talked about as a pain physician when we would prescribe high dose opioids for people who had opioids for a long time, they would have an idiosyncratic reaction, opposite reaction, just touching the skin. I'd put my stethoscope on a patient and they would scream in pain just from light touch and that's because their opioid receptors were acting erratically. Now we're seeing this with, um, with marijuana. This is a daily diagnosis in emergency departments across the United States. Every single day, any ER doctor you want to talk to in, in the United States will have treated a cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. The cannabinoid receptors are malfunctioning because they've been flooded with high potency for such a long time. Cannabis-induced psychosis, we mentioned um, that uh, association. Really studies out of Europe uh, looking at the difference between Paris and London, Amsterdam, where they had high potency uh, THC defined as 10%, and these are huge studies, multiple thousands of patients, and showed if you're a daily, regular, high potency user, your risk of psychosis is fivefold. Not everyone who's gonna use marijuana is gonna get psychosis. Just like not everybody who smokes tobacco is gonna get cancer or lung disease. But we recognize it now as a risk factor, right? Everybody who smokes cigarettes knows and understand the risks of you know, lung-related uh, illnesses. The same kind of thing applies to marijuana. There is a risk to psychosis, which with continued use can uh, happen to end up in schizophrenia. Not everybody, but it's definitely a risk factor. And suicide, I well, you know, copied what uh, people in Colorado was, were doing and looked at suicides under the age of 25, the age of the developing brain. The brain continues until you're 25 years old. That's why the addiction, is seven times, up to seven times more likely in the age under 25. Um, and it is the number one drug found in completed suicides in people who die by suicide, more than alcohol, more than anything else. Um, so a, a major association, that's a picture of Johnny Sachs, a beautiful boy, um, an athlete, you know, near perfect scores on his math, you know, a nice family. Um, and uh, you know, he started using marijuana when it became legal in Colorado, developed psychosis, and thought the mob was chasing him and jumped off a building to his death. The saddest podcast I ever did, I have, I'm a, a podcast host, is of parents, all who've lost their children from cannabis-induced psychosis. Um, very sad. This gentleman came to our emergency department in the middle of the pandemic. We all thought he had COVID. You know, we're dressed up in our uh, you know, hazmat suits, and he did not have COVID. He had a pneumothorax because he was in his room smoking, you know, uh, nervously, and he popped his lung. It's barotrauma. Um, this is a known effect. I actually have him on my podcast. He talked about his experience of what that was like. And we know. Um, uh, that you know, we all agree that tobacco now is well known that it hurts your your lungs. Smoking anything is bad for your bad for your lungs. And actually, they compare the amount of toxins from a marijuana joint to a vape to a, a, a blunt or in a cigarette. And the highest amount of um, uh, uh, secondhand smoke effects so actually was in a joint more than a, a, a cigarette. We've done also CAT scans of lungs of people who are tobacco users versus lungs of uh, people who are cannabis users. And you can see the difference that cannabis smoke is actually causes more damage that we see on CAT scans. Stroke, so I've had, we have a stroke center, about three different patients who come in as a stroke code. We do CAT scans, angiograms, rule out stroke. And at the end of the day, it was a stroke mimic from cannabis. Bleeding. Who ever heard of bleeding from marijuana? Does marijuana or cannabis cause bleeding? It, it doesn't cause it by itself. But if you're on a blood thinner and you take cannabis, CBD or THC, it, interact, it interacts in your liver in the cytochrome P450 system and increase your chances of bleeding. And this gentleman came to the emergency department three times and he said, well, I've used marijuana, or, you know, I'm a product from the 80s. I, I use all the time. I said, that was great, but now you have stents 
and you're on your Plavix, and it's not, it's interacting with your medications. Um, drug driving, we talked about, this is another beautiful boy who was killed by a marijuana impaired driver. I work in a trauma center, see this all the time. Someone is, you know, if there's an alcohol involved, then police are there taking samples, writing reports. And when marijuana is involved, they're just not there. And it's, it's very sad. And we share the roads with, with people who are impaired. Um, fentanyl and, and cannabis, again, fentanyl is a, a, a crazy epidemic in the United States. Uh, in San Diego alone, two and a half deaths a day from fentanyl. Um, is there an association? Um, so I, I don't think that at the dispensaries they're selling fentanyl. Um, but I'll have people tell me and swear they only use marijuana, I swear after they've overdosed, they give them the loxone and wake them up. And I think the bong and the object that they were using may have had some residue in it because they're testing positive for marijuana and fentanyl and they don't think that they were exposed. Um, so they're being tricked with that. There have been cases found of confiscated marijuana with um, fentanyl laced in it, so that has occurred. That's, you know, that's not a, the general thing that's, that's happening. Um, but, but, but there is an association. I ask every single person who I treat for opiate use disorder and get them started on buprenorphine. I ask them, you know, what's your drug of choice? How old were you when you started using drugs? And invariably, I, every single person who has an opiate use disorder started with marijuana at a very young age. So there are advisories. We all know about the Surgeon General warning on tobacco, right? That's, uh, that was based on about 6,000 different publications. We have more than that now on the harms of cannabis. We always say, well, we need more research. Of course, we always need more research. That'll be, you know, to the end of time, we're gonna want more research. But there's enough research today to talk about the harms and to talk about public health. And so we have an advisory on um, protecting the brain, the growing brain. With, um, uh, with cannabis. Um, we have warnings from the CDC about the contamination of uh, cannabis flower with um, E. coli, aspergillus, and it's not recommended for anybody who's immunocompromised. That is an alert from the CDC, especially for transplant patients. Um, and there are numerous medical societies who put advisories based on their specialties. Um, and you can access all of that on the Isaac website that Dr. Pippin mentioned. I think I have it here. The International Academy on the Impact of Science of Cannabis, isaac1.org. We have a complete, we have a, not a, a very incomplete library of um, medical references because there's so many. We've just selected the highest one. Again, it's available, it's translated for, to laymen with references on, um, for, for all that. And then uh, I put this up there because I, I figure I have a podcast and maybe there are some people here who want to be on my podcast um, with uh, programs that they're doing internationally. And if so, uh, um, please contact me.